Hi, this is another video on an engineering challenge that I encountered while working on an FPGA-based VR4300 CPU. Looking back at the primer video that I did, recall that the main internal processor structure consists of a register file and an ALU and a feedback path. If we want to optimize a design to clock as fast as possible, we must consider the speed of each component. While the ALU could pose issues, the slowest component candidate is actually the register file. Let's take a look at why this is. As you may recall, the VR4300 register file is actually a combined general purpose register and a floating point register file, resulting in effectively 64 64-bit entries. In addition to that, the register file must support two simultaneous read ports and a simultaneous write port. And on top of that, there is a timing quirk in the VR4300 pipeline where the register file is sandwiched between two opposite clock polarity pipeline registers. The register on the left is the write-back pipeline register, and the register on the right is the execution stage pipeline register. For reference, let's define the non-inverting clock as the positive polarity and the inverting clock as the negative polarity. Now the instruction fetch part of the pipeline is out of phase from the rest of the processor, acting on the negative clock, whereas the execution and data memory portion of the pipeline acts on the positive clock. And since the instruction fetches on the negative clock, the actual 32-bit instruction value is latched into a register on the negative clock. This means that the read addresses A and B will not be known until the negative clock latch when the instruction becomes available, leading to the register file requiring a half-cycle read. Furthermore, we may need to read the value that was just written in the previous breakback stage, which means that we either need to add bypass logic or also enable a half-cycle write and a half-cycle read. Let's look at the VR4300 timing diagram to help us understand this in a little more detail. The CPU clock, or P-clock, is broken down into phases, and I have extended the phase lines to help us see where the individual blocks line up. First thing to notice is that the instruction is not available until after the instruction fetch, and the register data needs to be read before the execution stage. You can see that we have a little block sitting between the two latches, called the RFR, or register file read block which has a length of a single phase, or half of a peak clock cycle. This is the half cycle read that I mentioned. On the other side, we have the write back register latch, which starts the RFW, or register file write block, which also has the length of a single phase, or half of a peak clock cycle. Notice that if we were to join the RFW and RFR blocks, we would get something like this, where the entire RF block is a full cycle, where the write data is latched on the falling edge of the clock, and the input and output data are latched on the rising edge. Now that we have the constraints defined for our register file, let's take a look at three potential implementations. First, we have a logic unit selector implementation, where each register line in the register file is implemented as a 64-bit register in a logic unit, and the output of all the registers is then sent to a large 64-input multiplexer. This is one way to implement memory in silicon. There are two big issues with this, however, where it takes up a lot of logic units to implement, and it could potentially end up being inefficient in logic usage due to the way multiplexers need to be a power of two. Additionally, note that we need a selection mux for address A and address B, so we have duplicate hardware here. The next implementation is that we can replace the large mux with a decoder, an AND mask, and a large OR gate. Here, the decoder takes in the addresses and asserts one of the 64 outputs to select the appropriate register. This will then allow the register value to pass through the AND gate mask and prevent the other register values from passing through. Then they only need to be recombined in an OR gate. As an aside, this is probably one of the better ways to implement a fully associative TLB in an FPGA, which I will discuss in another video. This implementation also has problems, where it once again takes up a lot of space and could result in inefficient logic unit usage. Again, note that we need two copies of this hardware, one for port A and one for port B. And finally, we have the block RAM implementation, which seems to be the favorite implementation among academic papers. Block RAMs, or BRAMs, are units within the FPGA, which are configurable SRAM blocks. These have their own address selection and decoding logic, as well as write logic. Typically, these are two-ported, meaning that we would need to duplicate block RAMs in order to have a two-port read with a one-port write, where we have one block RAM for port A and one block RAM for port B. Since FPGAs typically have on the order of a couple megabytes of block RAM storage, and the register file is only 512 bytes, this should be fine. However, there is a catch. The block RAM has a slower read and write than a logic unit register. Two block RAM diagrams are shown. Both do synchronous writes, and the top one does an asynchronous read, while the bottom does a synchronous read. Most block RAMs require synchronous reads, so a bypass register is added to provide the functionality of reading the value that was just written. All of these implementations are fairly trivial to write in a hardware description language. 
However, it had been requested that I show more HDL code, so here's an implementation using the block RAMs with an explicit bypass register. The other block RAM implementations were simpler than this, and the logic unit implementations were far too long to fit on a single screen, but were exactly what you would expect from the previous block diagrams. At the top, I instantiate two block RAMs, one for port A and one for port B. These have the same write signals, but are duplicated since most of the block RAMs only contain two ports. The component that is being instantiated is written in VHDL and is not a vendor-specific IP. This relies on the compiler inferring a block RAM, but leads to greater portability. I specified a few block RAM behaviors through VHDL, providing the asynchronous and the synchronous read types. Here I specify that I want to instantiate the synchronous read via the part of the code that says entity pork.sram in parentheses rsws, where rsws is the specific component implementation. As a side note, this is how you can quickly switch and test multiple design implementations without modifying other parts of the code. So if I wanted to do the asynchronous read version, I would only need to change rsws to raws and everything would update. I use the same technique when optimizing components. For example, the code you see here is denoted by RTL5 of the combined register file component. In terms of the constants, the value n corresponds to the data width, which is 64 in the case of the VR4300, and both the size and address width tell us how many entries the register file should have. Since we have 64 register file lines, the constant r is set to 6, where 2 to the power 6 is equal to 64 and you can see the evaluation of 2 to the power r for the size parameter. The next thing I have is the bypass register latching behavior, which simply latches the right value to a register on the rising edge of the clock. And then I have the output behavior, which consists of two identical if-l statements, one for port A and one for port B. The basic behavior here is to set the output of line 0 to 0. This is because the register 0 in the MIPS architecture is defined to always contain the value 0. Then I also check to see if we need to use the bypass register, which is only the case if we are reading from the right address and we are trying to write to that address. So if the value of the write port was garbage and not intended to be written back, we don't need to select the bypass register. And finally, we have the pass-through condition, which sets the output of the block RAM to be the output of the component. The same block is duplicated below for port B, replacing the relevant signals. One thing to note is that because of the way this was written, this implementation could be used for an arbitrary number of register file lines for arbitrary data width, so nothing would change for the R3000 used in the PlayStation. As you may recall from the leading zero counter video, I am placing the component between two I.O. registers to get a sense for timing. Additionally, I am using a negative clock for the register file and a negative clock for the address A and address B inputs. Unlike last time, I am going to test the synthesis on two specific devices. These are the Altera Cyclone 5 with a speed grade of C7 and the Xilinx Arctic 7 with a speed grade of Dash 1. The reason for choosing these two devices with those specific speed grades is that those are both available on Terrasic and Digilent development boards, respectively. I have also included their maximum block RAM speeds as well as their respective global clock speeds. It should be noted that the setup and hold times for the logic unit registers for the Arctic 7 are lower than the Cyclone 5s meaning that even though the global clock speed for the Arctic 7 is less than that of the Cyclone 5s, the implemented Fmax may actually be higher for the Arctic 7. Note that in both cases, the actual implemented Fmax will most likely be below the global clock Fmax of the Arctic 7. With that said, let's see how both devices and synthesizers did. Note that for the Cyclone 5, I'm using Altera synthesizer, Cordis, and for the Arctic 7, I'm using Xilinx's synthesizer, Vivado. The LUs listed by the Cyclone 5 are the ALMs, the Altera Combinational Logic Blocks, and the FFs listed are the 1-bit registers. The LUs listed for the Arctic 7 are the lookup tables, and the FFs are the 1-bit flip-flops. Additionally, as far as I can tell, Vivado does not perform a timing analysis as comprehensive as what Cordis does, so I will only be including the basic FMAX calculated from the timing slack. Cyclone 5's Fmax comes from both the slow models and the fast models, being the worst case and the best case, represented by an S and an F, respectively. And of course, all values of Fmax are in megahertz. And finally, both synthesizers are running with default settings. As for the results, keep in mind that these numbers do also include the I.O. registers, guarding the design. However, those are constant for all the synthesis runs. There are five implementations listed here. The register file using the logic unit selector, the register file using the logic unit decoder and an OR gate, and three block RAM implementations. 
first block of implementation is with the asynchronous read, but a synchronous write. The second is with both synchronous read and synchronous write. And the third is with a synchronous read and a synchronous write, an additional bypass register for reading the value that was just written. The first thing that I want to note is that we have a few asterisks. For the LU selector, Cordis instantiated some block RAM components along with regular registers. After spending a while looking at the technology map view, it seemed that Cordis actually instantiated the general purpose registers as logic unit registers and the floating point registers as block RAMs. It also included bypass logic to allow the read after write functionality the maps register file requires. The reason for the odd distribution is that the total number of register bits is 4096, half of which belong to the floating point registers and the other half to the general purpose registers. So clearly Quartus implemented the floating point registers as two block RAMs, one for port A and one for port B. This is more apparent in the BRAM asynchronous read case, where the total number of memory bits is double the total register bits, where the block RAMs are duplicated to emulate a dual port read and a single port write. Note that in this case, Cordis also instantiated bypass logic to perform the required read after write functionality. The logic unit usage for Cordis went down even further in the synchronous read case, which is due to the fact that there is no bypass logic needed. It should be noted that this case will probably not provide the correct read after write functionality required by the MIPS register file. Nevertheless, it is still important to include for comparison. Interestingly, by implementing the bypass register logic ourselves, we save a few logic units and gain a modest speed boost of 2 MHz on the Cyclone 5. Now back to those asterisks. You may notice that none of the Arctic 7 implementation used the block RAMs. This was something that was puzzling me. However, it appears that the Xilinx 7 series has the ability to reconfigure the logic unit lookup tables as fast distributed RAM. I'm not exactly sure how to force Vivado to instantiate block RAM instead. However, using a distributed RAM like this might provide a higher clock frequency. There are a few things to take note of here. None of the Cyclone 5 implementations go above the block RAM frequency of 275 MHz. In fact, none go above 238 MHz. Using a pure register and logic unit approach always results in a slower and resource heavy implementation when compared to using block RAMs. We can ignore the block RAM synchronous read case since there will be no clock transition between the time the instruction is available and the data needs to be latched into the pipeline registers. Though we could potentially add another clock, which is one quarter period out of phase to the CPU clock, which may allow us to use such an implementation. That, however, adds another level of complexity that I don't really want to get into. And finally, the Arctic 7 implementations have a higher clock frequency than the Cyclone 5s, which is what I predicted earlier. That may sound strange, but I wrote the prediction part of the script before doing any of the synthesis runs. So which of these implementations should we choose? We can remove the full logic unit implementations from the list due to their high LU count and low speeds, which leaves us essentially with the asynchronous read block RAM or the block RAM with the bypass register. Note that the only real difference here is whether or not we are asking the synthesizer to infer and implement the bypass register logic for us. The interesting thing is that in both cases, the one where we explicitly implement the bypass register result was faster. And on top of that, the Cyclone 5 implementation used less logic units, but the Arctic 7 used more logic units. Though the difference is relatively minor, so I'm not exactly sure which one to pick. To help, let's consider other devices and the families. I have reproduced the synthesis results for the Cyclone 5 C6 speed grade, which is the fastest, and the Arctic 7-3 speed grade, which is the fastest. This was done with the hope that the design difference would be more apparent. Here the IBP is the inferred bypass logic and the EBP is the explicit bypass logic. For some unknown reason, the higher speed grade actually degraded the clock performance for the inferred bypass logic in the Cyclone 5, while the explicit bypass logic produced a marginal increase in the maximum clock speed. Also, strangely, the explicit bypass implementation used five less registers in the C6 Cyclone 5. As for the Arctic 7, the speed improved with both cases being around 80 MHz faster using the same number of resources. Unfortunately, the difference between the two is still marginal. So with that said, given the drop in performance for the Cyclone 5, I would opt to choose the explicit bypass implementation over the inferred one. Additionally note that the 403 register units used by the Arctic 7 implementation is less than 0.15% of the total resources on the largest Arctic 7. There are a few things to take note of with these results. The Fmax here sets the upper limit for the fastest any VR4300 implementation can clock at on these four devices. Luckily, all of these Fmax values are above the 93.75 MHz used by the N64, 
However, this means that we won't be implementing an N64 CPU overclocked to 400 MHz. The VR4300 register file is quite large by most CPU standards, having 64 lines being 64 bits each. Most CPUs have significantly smaller register files, where the PowerPC Gecko processor used by the GameCube only contains 16 32-bit registers. It is very likely that a smaller register implementation would be able to operate at a higher clock speed, though I have not actually tried to implement one, so I can't say for certain. And finally, the PlayStation 2's R5900 CPU operates at around 295 MHz, which is above both the speed limits for the Cyclone 5 and the limit on the Dash 1 speed grade with RTX 7. The register file here, however, only has 32 lines, being 128 bits wide. Width is not an issue, since the logic runs in parallel, and the fewer lines by a factor of 2 might just boost the Arctic 7-1 speed grade to meet the required frequency. If not, the 286 MHz is close enough to 295 MHz that there may not be much of a difference. We can note, though, that the Cyclone 5 has no hope at implementing a 295 MHz R5900 CPU for the PlayStation 2. Anyways, hopefully you found this interesting, another seemingly trivial engineering problem that ended up being more complicated. Thanks for watching.